payment mechanisms. Um, here we'll be looking at features of um, revenue regimes and then payment mechanisms. And then we'll be touching on some of which we've um, spoken to before, um, like the government pay PPPs, the user pay PPPs, and what have you. The mechanisms with which private partners receive revenues with which it covers its costs of deploying a PPP service. Sometimes I've gotten through equity, debt obligations, but must be linked to its um, cost benefit analysis with clarity on how it will generate its profits and how it will monitor performance. As such, the payment mechanisms or this a suitable mechanism for such for, for, for a PPP or private party to consider would depend on the nature it is of the project and the modalities it is considering to achieving the project and purposes, either from equity or debt and all of those. All those comes to determine um, the payment mechanisms to deploy, uh, to consummate or fulfill the contract. Um, for, in the case of government PPPP, the revenue stream almost ex exclusively comprises of regular payments from the government. And this is a PPP arrangement too, where it's only government that pays for the service. So a, a, an illustration might be a case where government knows they need more ports so that they will facilitate trade. Maybe from projection economic analysis, there is every indication that trade would skyrocket or multiply. And the government know that with the current trade, trade infrastructure as ports and um, this and that, they wouldn't be able to contain the surge or the growth. And while government know that they need more ports, they have little budgetary provisions for ports, perhaps due to the size of the fiscal puffers. In such a case, government can reach out and even aside from the budgetary provisions or capacity of the government, it might be a case of government know that they can't efficiently run a port and they know they need more ports. So they might reach out, reach, make a call for PPP expressions of interest, UI, and then and say interested parties should express interest sending sending um, proposals and all. In that case, government might make a, a, the, 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 the argument might be that the government, while the private sector will sink their costs initially, depending on however they will get the money, maybe through, maybe through establishing of a special purpose vehicle, getting loan instruments or debt instruments from banks or whatever, or anyhow, or just through synergy, um, what they call structured financing. Um, whatever approach they will put, the negotiation with the government might be that government, government is telling them, we don't have any time to put in this. We might be able to provide you with statutory support, like access to land, since the government is the owner of land. Maybe that's our own contribution to this project in kind. And then when you finish the project, based on how you forecast the expenses and the um, revenue stream you want to earn, we can spread it over a 40 year period. So if you spent maybe 20 billion to do this project, but from the financial models, you envisage to realize 30 billion. That means the profit for what you have done is 10 billion. I'm just hypothesizing. The government can negotiate that, okay, but this PPP is over a 40 year period. You will be sure that within this 40 year period, you are de 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 delivering social, social services, you are ensuring that the the port is 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 in a state of heart condition. It's is 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 um, has a high level of ton um, um, container turnover such that there are no gridlocks and inefficiencies. Like it will put the conditions once they negotiate. The agreement might be that okay, since we are expending twenty billion to achieve this project from our cost analysis, 
and we envisage to realize a markup or a margin of maybe 40% for our profit. And that means the total monies we should expect from the government should be 30 billion. That means an extra 10 billion. Let's spread it over the lifetime of this project, which might be a 40 years or a 25 years project. Okay, how much would government pay us for each 25 year, each, each year in 25 years? That will make up for the total revenue projections we have we have put into the books. So it might turn out that a 30 billion in in 25 years would be maybe a 1.3 billion annual payment. That might be feasible because the government as of now does not have the 20 billion to put. So if government rather would achieve that project by putting an annual an annual 1.3 billion, it frees up the remaining 18.7 billion that government would have staked. And they'll be using that 18.7 billion to do other things, education, sports, and then uh, healthcare and all of those. So that's the beauty of PPP. So government saves itself of the burden of incurring a huge cost that we deny it of performing other duties it could have performed within its lean, its revenue scope. And so paying it in a staggered way over a period of time, we yet achieve the value of the project that needs to be done now, not deferring it because there are no enough money. And do you know the economic value of putting the pots and all the trade and all the tax government will receive and all of those. And you will realize that in the end, the project in itself might have paid for the monies that the private sector put from the way government will generate value from it. So, so you, they can structure it that way and look if a government pay PPP works. And in that case, it's not private parties that are paying for it. But there are other cases where it's user pay, where government knows we need to do this project. We don't want to put our money in it. And when this project is done, we would we think the public can pay for it. That's the case of some two routes. You won't find two routes, routes that have two gates in, in rural places because you subject uh, PPP to uh, socioeconomic analysis too. You would put it where the people have the socioeconomic capacity to pay. So you would find two roads in eyebrow areas or, or industrial areas where companies are, are, are conspicuous or, you know, and the economic justification for that is these players or these economic actors can pay for this infrastructure. And the private party that would provide this infrastructure would be in the, inv involved in maintenance. So many times, even if government had done the road without a tool, you find that government has the problem of inadequate maintenance. It's, it's until something goes terribly bad before you would see that they are paying attention to it. But if a private sector is in charge of that PPP, even when the slightest portal opens up, they would mend it because that summer portal is it, it teaching time saves nice. So when it's delayed, it becomes worse and it becomes a big project to address or redress the problem. So government might look at its inefficiencies in maintaining infrastructures and determine that. We might not want to do this project with our money. We want to bring in private parties. And these people in this economic class and in this category where they will be the users of this, they are capable, at least from a benchmark analysis or so. And we might make a justification that, okay, a reasonable and benevolent price that would justify the revenues of the private parties investing into this project. And that will also not be exorbitant or extraneous for the beneficiaries should be this. And if we make the price this, if we spread it over so so, so volume of usage and then um, so 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 amount of turning revenue turning per month or per year and over a period of so 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 number of years, the private party should have made its money, rendered the service the government wanted to do, maybe build, operate and transfer or whatever, then hand over back or maybe the project can be the, the, the PPP arrangement can be renewed. So yeah, sometimes people government can achieve a lot of projects without even spending money ever. 
and yet guarantee that the private sector would realize their money. So in those cases, there are a lot of ways to look at the dynamics of PPP. But in any way, PPPs help the government to achieve more than it would achieve with its own money. Uh, so that's the case here. So um, that's payment regime and managing the budget during operation phase. You want to think about how will the money revenues be managed such that the private sector don't deviate from purpose. And then there's a level of integrity in how things go. So I have mentioned that financial modeling happen and then must be used by both parties. So sometimes the private sector would have modeled the financial implications of doing the project, but the government too needs to model the financial implications of doing the project independently. So that where the private sector has overpriced some things, the government can see it from its book that why is your um, total out, um, financial obligations so high when ours is saying that this can finish the project. By the time there is a buy side and a sell side negotiation, you will find that there is a middle ground. Maybe the final private sector will adjust some cost elements they have put into it. But in the case where it's only private sector that brings the financial model, the government does not do its own financial model for due diligence purposes. It might result in a case of overpriced projects. Overpriced projects is not a good thing for the economy. The monies that would have been redeemed to do other things of economic value is being carted away by somebody who maybe for purposes of profit maximization is being very, 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 um, very high in his um, expectations from a project. And so it's not, it's a disservice to the economy. Well, we are, and that's why in a PPP project, it's open to many people. So that if one person is overpricing, you will see another person's prices, you know, and everybody knowing that they are competing, you won't want to cost your project unreasonably. You want to be genuine, you want to be transparent, you want to be clear that, okay, I want to make social so profit. I will not call one bag of cement um, um, $2,000 when it is $200. You know, you would put all, I will not quantify bitumen. I will not say I need 1 million bitumen when I need uh, just 10, 10, 10 bitumen. You know, all those would go and those audit process need to happen so that it will really serve the value of maximizing the financial capacity of the economy and then the expedite increasing the number of social and economic infrastructures that can be available to um, increase economic activities without one party within the system of. So that's that financial model is critical and financial model is initially developed by the government. It's appointed, it appoints in the advisors in order to predict the private sector's costs, financing structures and all of those. Um, during the bidding stage, the preferred bidder, based on how realistic their financials are and everything, is he also develops his own financial models for for judgments and negotiations, which reflects specific cash flow required to deliver a project. So, um, colleagues, ultimately, the preferred bidder's financial model becomes the business case for implementing the project, and so. But that's not without negotiations and then a middle ground after the uh, comparisons and all. So, so, so um, um, on that payment mechanisms, we also look at um, managing contractual payments. You, we want to be sure that, um, you know, um, fulfilling a contractual obligation is very complex. The government has it's statutory fiscal tax obligations and even policies that the, gov the private sector should comply with. So maybe the tax obligations, even when they are doing the PPP, they are, the private party still has taxes to pay because, I mean, it's doing its business and it will make its benefits from it. The, private, the government needs to audit its books and check, it, check its history, whether it's compliant, whether it has some on, 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 um, shady financial records and history, 
corruption and all of those. So, so, and, and so effective financial administration involves developing of a system and procedure to make and receive financial payments. The government might have some ISO standards that the private sector must comply with and all, and it must be it must be compliant to some regulatory procedures that some the, a designated regulatory authority has put in place. You know, so the government, because it's entering a PPP, should not compromise on that. So they will always want to be sure that the payment structures, maybe there's the government that has a local content policy that for some nature of work, it is locals that must be hired. And they might have a minimum wage policy that you can't pay lesser than this. The government wants to be sure that you, you, you comply with all of those. A government that signed minimum wage policy in its, in its legislations would do not enter a contract with you where you are paying below the minimum wage to, to, some, to some very, very junior or um, um, negligent, negligible re responsibilities like cleaners and all, the government will still want to uphold the integrity of its policy. So those, all those goes into consideration when looking at managing contractual payment and verifying or vetting the integrity of the actions of the private play players. Yeah, so that said, we also look at con contingency planning in payment mechanisms, there are provisions for contingency planning because there are occasions for circumstances beyond um, beyond them um, what is necessary, like in the case of force major, and even not even force major, which is an act of nature, other circumstances like accidents or, or maybe overnight change in costs and other things. So those are contingencies. Contingencies are more like emergency occurrences that they shouldn't necessarily happen on a good day, but they have happened or they could happen. So contingency planning is one of the most important steps within contractual management. And it makes your planning very realistic such that you are not thinking in a linear way. Um, financial allocations for PPP, both government and the private partner should undertake contingency planning. So now the contingency planning should include emergency planning measures that should be implemented in the event of major incidents you know, like in Nigeria last year, there was a, a, a organized but very organic um, protests. You can't place your hands on who were the orchestrators of this. It just went viral, the answers. Projects were halted. Contractors couldn't do their works for a period of time. It affected their their project plans and all of those. So you want to be sure that, oh, should there be socioeconomic instability, this and that and that, beyond the regular envisaged plans, you know, you would be sure that if you factor it in or you made provisions for that, you, you would not be cut at back. And you know, sometimes when those are halted, maybe there is a delivery of a um, cement or mix or pre-mixed cement that is already on the way by the time the social instability happened. All that goes bad. So you want to be very um, reasonable in, and realistic so that it takes care of unforeseen circumstances. Um, that's that. um, and so, however, it generally does not make sense to maintain a large con contingency reserve. So you, you can't say because um, you don't know where a problem will occur in the, co in the course of the project. You now plan for a contingency cost that is almost 50% of the real project, or even like 70%. The government is not a, a cash cow. You just want to be realistic, maybe a 10% markup for contingency provisions and all of those. And, and mind you, this is a competitive process. So if you do something indiscretion, it's, or your institution or private organization wants to make a take advantage of the opportunity to offer a PPP service. There are other reasonable players who are costing things right. So you might just be outplaying yourself by not being fake in doing what is reasonable. So, so that's that. And then we have managing or renewal of funds. Yeah, so even in the process of getting funds, 
funds can be given in tranches depending on the negotiations from players and all and all so and even when the cycle of a fund has been exhausted there might be rooms for renewal depending on how the old, old process has been planned there must be that clarity the government must see it such so that you don't enter the project and you now stop halfway the project cannot move forward it cannot move backwards then the government did not derive value for entering the ppp arrangement and all. it's a very it's a very 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 how do i put it um nuanced process we have, we want to be sure all the boxes are checked if you are running a special purpose vehicle for this you want to see all the agreements that each party considered to to make the project work what are the modalities for how each party will play at different places whether it's a bank that is inside the consortium or whatever so we, we it's a critical point in this consideration and even the role of the government in it and all so that said standards regulation when dealing with ppp i told you the government won't compromise the standards even if it's entering a ppp if the government has a minimum wage policy they want to be sure you would comply with it in delivering the project you know they want to check their books if they have said that you know a, a construction companies must pay so 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 um, construction adequacy tax or this and that they want to be sure that because you are in the project you will do that except they make for a waiver for you and that will be deliberately discussed. So they will know that. And when you are granted a waiver, a waiver is granted on the basis of acknowledging the policy or the regulation that requires you to do something. So it's still in the light of recognizing that there's a policy that we must keep to. So um, all of those go into it. Now, various regulatory frameworks aim among other objectives to per permit the government to consider and make rational choices as to which projects to implement as PPP. Even the government's um, economic development plan my state that um, the government is focusing on maybe five points, five point agenda, development agenda, education, women empowerment, this and that. And sometimes they subject it to the kind of PPPs they will consider. So they will not come and be considering military costs when the their economic agenda is saying this i'm just hypothesizing it's not like they will not do it like a budget should touch on every aspect of the economy but you will see where the focus of the government is reflected in even their budgetary provision as it aligns to the economic plan they are working towards so various tests and standards are set mainly to ensure that the ppp is affordable to the country and the users the execution of the work under the PPP provides greater value for money than if done under traditional procurement, uh, greater value for money if done under traditional procurement. And to ensure that risk transfers, because when you are doing a PPP, the project is still for the government. The government has only transferred the risk of delivering the project to the private party. So, so it's a service rendered by the private party to do that project. The project is the government. Um, so you want to be sure that all the nuances for adequate risk transfer is done. Because if this is not carefully done, it will result in a lot of disputes. And so that's that. Um, variation management. The government wants to provide for variations because in the course of the project, if it's a five-year project, if it's a 25 years project, even if it's a two-year project, that the initial bulk of implementing the project is within two years and other ones will be maintenance and operations. The government wants to be sure that we take care of possibilities of variation. Variation in even government side, government might change policies that might affect the project. Like all of a sudden, the Nigeria government bad borders for about over a year because they felt there was, there was smuggling, there was a lot of abuse of um, trade, uh, abusive trade practices be, with, with, our, with our borders, the borders were porous and all. The government wasn't taking PPPs into consideration when it made that decision. It just made that unilateral decision. And who knows, there might be some consignments on the way across borders that might have affected those who have entered some PPP with the government. So all those variations needs to be taken that, oh, 
this might have added an additional cost. So when the government makes such policy, it now makes screening processes at the, at the border more tight. And maybe that means more delays, meaning that what would have entered in maybe two days now takes five days. So all those small, small things, it sounds like contingency planning, but it's not in this case, but more of a mutual understanding of this is likely to happen. Even you government, you can change one or two policies that will affect what we want to do. And, and you would not stop we told from doing the policy because of us. You are a government to the people, not to the companies. So small work and variations. Government can all of a sudden change policy that, oh, we, we have heard the complaints of um, 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 low level staffs or this and that, or they, are, they can even change policy of, of expatriate quota and decide that we don't want expatriates to be dominating operations when they are local competent hands to do this. You know, when different necessary policy changes happen, all of those must go into the compliance of the private actors. So, and even the private party too can make for variation, maybe official policies of the government, of the company from its headquarters, or might affect one or two things. And so they, they, they put all those into consideration to know that things will not totally deviate from what has been agreed, but there are rooms for such occurrences and changes. So, and when it happens, this is how we would handle it. Variation procedures must be used effectively to ensure that other important functions, such as performance management, risk management, continue to operate in line with what is expected. Um, so that said, we then try to get to relationship management, issue management, and dispute resolution. You know, this is like the climax of this very important um, session. Every, there's always room for this sport. There's always room and no contract or um, no contract or PPP contract can exhaustively take care of everything. There are still one or two things that might come up that is not within or even that is within but came out in a different light. And so in those cases, there are rooms for middle grounds, dispute resolutions and all. And in the case where a party is, is not acting as to agreement, it's also a moment for dispute resolution or relationship management or issue management. So it's up to, it's very important at this point Relationship management is collaboratively working relationships that actively support and enhance the relationship throughout this life cycle of the project. It's another crucial element of project management. As such, it requires policies, procedures, lines of reporting to be clearly established. Uh, implement relationship management may lead to issues and disputes. And when there are disputes, progress in achieving a project might be halted or not served in a way that meets expectations. Um, so relationship management or issue management or dispute resolution solutions are often required to deal with issues and disputes that may arise in the project life cycle. And this can arise at any point in the project cycle. Um, yeah, most times issues or disputes occur when one of both parties have different perceptions or interpretations of the terms of the contract. That's a way issues can occur. That's why no party should be negligent of the, 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 the content of the contract. Read it exhaustively. Have your legal players consider it, negotiate it through to the point you put pen to paper to countersign and say both the government and the public enters into it. It's good for due diligence such that nothing comes back to tell you or later. Like, for instance, pardon me, you want to enter a contract with a Chinese company, a Japanese company. A Nigerian company with its official language, English, cannot be signing a, 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 an arrangement that is written in Chinese. No, it's wrong. What can you read there? Even if you have an interpreter, you are, you are, you are, you are at the distance, are, there's a gap there. If there, are, if there are issues, and this comes to play when you see all these, um, Chinese concessions and all of that. I'm sorry, I'm not talking against Chinese, I know. but 
in to manage these situations you don't you don't enter contracts that you have not exhaustively um understood analyzed val qualify and validate every clause that's why we enter a lot of problematic agreements and all of those even um, bilateral treaties and agreements and all of those that needs to be taken very seriously if the government country does not want to make a mess of itself and the prospects of its citizens um, yeah, so managing expiry defaults and early termination processes there are times when the project can be called off that's it it's no more worthwhile to continue this we are sorry these arrangements we are con it can come from the public sector it can come from the private sector the private sector has the right to say i'm no more doing this but either way there might be arrangements to achieve that we are okay if it's the government that is calling off this project they call those two they must give us so, so, so percent of projects because we have staked some things and at the point wherever they stop us we might have some irredeemable costs and all of those there must be agreements exhaustive agreement and the government too can see oh if the private sector is the one that has to do this and do that, we have there are terms and conditions for which this must happen if there's a need for early termination or default. Or, and the government must be clear. And sometimes you word it with strong carrots and strong sticks, such that everybody knows that they must sit tight to achieve the purpose for the social economic good of the populace. So it's not a very loose period when there is negligence everywhere, even in the agreement and the implementation process. Yeah. yeah. So, so early termination of a PPP contract is truly a last resort and must follow several processes. Um, it's uh, before even early termination, there will be a dispute process, and um, every party would have tried to see what they can do to remediate. Um, but if it's seeming not to work out, early termination is like a last resort. And then, and but but then there is always what for dispute resolution processes, and it might also mean alternative dispute resolution, um, ADR, where you might want to settle out of court and all of that. It depends on how things are considered in the agreement. So please let's not let's all wear the lenses that while we want to expedite trade and invite private funding to do a lot and do more than what the public funds can achieve. We want to be sure that we are not taking all this negligence because if you don't, it turns back to harm the economy and the economy ends up not achieving the reasons why it wanted the project in the first place. Then it's a good for nothing or it's even a social bad because it might even reverse progress more than when you even enter the arrangement. Um, so that's that. Um, so um, reasons for early termination includes the following government defaults. I've spoken to that in a bit. Private partner defaults, first major, if it's a severe first major that beats imagination and it's not manageable, you know. Um, imagine the case of, um, imagine the case of Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing, nuclear works that happened between Japan and US. It's literally almost obliterated the whole of Japan or a significant portion of Japan. I mean, no, no, no emergency or uh, emergency or contingency plan can manage that. So if such kind of force major can can occur and just natural give the projects natural death. Are you with me? And um, unilateral termination, like the party just say, I'm no more doing, I'm no more doing. And he has the right to do that if he wants to bear the cost of doing that. And so, so, so such of course, um, example, key components of government contingency plans, events that will lead to service failures and or defaults, impact of services, impact on the services, both short and long term, remedies and time scale in the, in the contract, emergency planning measures in the event of a major incident, communication strategy, staff and resources and how this will be mobilized in the, at the short notice the whole part of emergency plan and all of those you know to wrap up you know it's part of even it can be as little as road safety rules that the government wants to be sure this company will be compliant to 
it might be as little as emergency and fire services obligation. So, and since government has a fire service unit, the Ministry of Interior and that manages that, there are policies existing that the company must quali comply to. So there will be those due diligence, very nuanced procedures. Yeah, the government might have work balance policies and be sure that, oh, you handle workers um, fairly and then you don't overwork them. You make sure you pay over time if they have to do. And the company must keep books of time sheets of staff so that they can report adequately that they comply. So all this nuance is going to transmit in PPP and it's not shoddy. So in the light of this, we have carefully come to analyze and look at how PPP can serve our respective clients very much good. And then we we'll want our participants to go to the discussion board and then kindly post their questions, comments, contributions on the dedicated course board. Also tell us how nice these processes of learning has been. Um, and um, we wish you the very best. Thank you for your time. Bye.